Hi everyone, Ollie here. Welcome back to the channel once again. In this video, we're going to be discussing how healthcare in the UK actually works. Now, it might seem like a bit of a weird thing to talk about, but when you go to your medical interviews, it's reasonable for them to assume that you have some knowledge of how the UK medical system works. It's actually more complicated than you might think, particularly for those of you who I know are applying for medical school from outside the UK and your own systems might be very different. So this is aimed at those people as well as, you know, those people in the UK that maybe haven't dealt that much with the healthcare system or aren't familiar with how every level of it actually works and how it's organized. So this is just gonna be a rough overview of how our system works. So as I'm sure many of you know, we have what's called the National Health Service that in theory is meant to provide free healthcare to anyone who needs it at the time when they need it. And the NHS gets its money because it's a government organization. It has to be funded by the government from two major sources. The vast bulk of this money comes from taxation of the working populace, and then a smaller supplementary amount comes from what's called the national insurance contribution. Exactly how much money the NHS receives every year as a percentage of GDP is determined by the government during what's called the spending review. So for a given year, it will be decided exactly how much money is gonna be sent to the NHS. And because that doesn't cover quite everything, there's a couple of other ways that the NHS can get its money. The first is by charging for prescription items. So the current prescription charge is about nine pounds. And between this and charges for some dental services, this makes up about 1% of the NHS's income every year. And because the NHS is devolved into kind of geographical trusts, which all act a little bit autonomously, if they want to bring money in in other ways, they can do that. For example, by charging for parking um, in hospital car parks. They might sell off any land they have or just assets that they generally hold to shareholders, which in turn can bring private money in. And some trusts can also choose to treat patients privately to boost their funds as well. So now the NHS has its money, it exists. How do we use it? Well. If you or I were to suddenly become ill, we might make an appointment with our general practitioner, our GP. Although it's a bit of a paradoxical term, these are specialist doctors who are trained as generalists. And they have to be familiar with a very wide range of conditions because anything can obviously come through the door. And the key thing is that they can spot when something really serious is wrong. And GPs form the medical wing of what is called primary care. That is the part of the NHS that a patient first deals with when they notice that they have a problem. And it includes other services such as dental practices, pharmacists, optometrists, usually the community setting in which you will receive your healthcare. But then a GP will either provide the advice if it needs advice or any medical treatment that the patient can receive in their own practice. Or if the situation needs it, they might refer you on to a specialist service. And any drugs that a patient needs, whether it's antibiotics or antihypertensives, diabetes medications, whatever, are provided by a prescription. So it's a signed piece of paper from the doctor saying, you know, my patient needs this, give it to them, which they then take to the pharmacy. A pharmacist then has a look. They use their own knowledge to check that everything's kind of in order and the prescription makes sense and is safe. And then all being well, they will dispense that medication and the patient can go off and take it. In the primary care setting, you might also be seen by maybe a nurse in the community or maybe a community physiotherapist. Basically, if someone can deal with you safely in the community, that's usually preferable at this stage. However, in emergencies such as cardiac arrest or stroke, more serious things that might kill you, it's more appropriate for someone to ring 999, call an ambulance, and you will be taken immediately to hospital. You'll go to the A&E or accident and emergency department, and all the staff here are trained in very acute life-threatening presentations. This level of the NHS, because we're now in a hospital, kind of very well-equipped setting, this is known as secondary care. And hospitals, unlike community settings, can provide a very wide range of staff with a huge range of specialist skills, with a lot more advanced equipment than would be available, for example, in your average GP practice, just because they have more space, more money, more staff. And secondary care is best represented by your local kind of district general hospital, not the huge ones, 
but the one that you might find attached to a reasonably sized town. While you're in hospital, a doctor will be placed in charge of your care and will ultimately decide what treatment it is you're gonna receive. And while you're there, you'll be looked after by nurses, healthcare assistants, again, physiotherapists, pharmacists, many, many different types of health professional that you would find in the average hospital. Then the final organizational level of the NHS is what are known as tertiary centers. So we've gone primary, secondary, tertiary, and these are the largest, big, expensive modern hospitals. These units are usually hallmarked by their ability to provide very specialist and niche services, such as cancer therapy, organ transplants, plastic surgery. To use these centers, patients might have to travel quite a long way. Waiting lists can be very, very long for access to these services, and you will almost always require a referral from your GP to use these settings. For those of you coming to med school, it's very, very likely that you will spend some time at a tertiary centre because they have access to virtually every specialty that exists in medicine and the biggest teaching hospitals tend to be tertiary centres. So where I'm based, University Hospital Coventry in Warwickshire is the big teaching hospital for the region. Although of course we have learning in the other hospitals as well. Examples of these big centres include places like Great Ormond Street Hospital in London and the Royal Victoria Infirmary in Newcastle upon Tyne. Now I know I said that was the last one. There is another small group of centres you might find it purely interesting to know about. And these are called the Major Trauma Centres or MTCs. There are only 30 31 of these hospitals across all of England and Scotland. And the point of these is to provide immediate life-saving therapy for the most dangerous and life-threatening conditions. Basically traumatic injury that's gonna kill someone pretty soon if we don't do something. As you might have guessed, Every single one of these units is based in a tertiary centre and they have things like surgical theatres and CT scanners permanently active and open, ready to go at the drop of a hat because a case might come in at literally any time of the day or night. So those are the different types of hospital and now we're very briefly gonna go through what might happen if you need to be admitted to one of these hospitals. So if a patient is severely unwell and they're told that they need to stay in hospital, they will check in and become what's known as an inpatient. That means they're gonna receive a bed on a hospital ward and be assigned a consultant specialist doctor who is gonna look after their medical management. How long they stay is simply determined by quite how sick they are when they come in and the nature of the treatment that they require because some things are a lot more complicated than others, as well as how quickly they recover once they've had it. Something like a broken bone, you might be looking at you know, three days, um, you could be in and out to have that fixed, but a really severe pneumonia or other kind of infection can take weeks and weeks and weeks to clear. And quite simply, once their managing doctor decides that they're well enough to go home, they are discharged and someone can come get them or they can go themselves. Or perhaps they might simply be discharged to a district general or a less specialist hospital when they don't need that level of care anymore. And then that bed can be freed up and someone else can take it. Now, something it's really important to note is that in line with patient autonomy, patients can actually self-discharge from hospital at any time. Even if this flies in the face of every bit of medical advice they've been given, if they've got capacity, they don't have to consent to treatment. And even if it's certain that they're gonna die, if they're kind of mentally fit to make that decision, no one can stop them going home. So let's say you've been into hospital, you've come out, your condition has resolved. Some patients will still need monitoring just to check how they're doing. This just prevents any remission to where they were before or further injury that they might acquire. And this is often done during daytime hospital appointments where these specialist services can be accessed without having to stay in the hospital overnight. And depending on what type of doctor you're talking to about this, they might be referred to as day cases um, in the name of surgery, there are day surgical units, or perhaps outpatients if you're just going to see your medical consultant about your blood pressure, asthma, just anything that needs checking up. So you're still a patient, but you're outside the hospital, you are an outpatient. So a surgical day case for comparison might mean something like removal of a breast lump or maybe removal of a suspicious looking skin lesion. And in these cases, the patient can just come in, you know, have the operation under local anesthetic, get it done, go home. And just something to be aware of, the last common instance in which a patient might want to interact with a doctor might be to receive something called a fit note, which obviously was previously known as a sick note, but we don't use that terminology anymore. 
If a person requires significant time off work, which is usually if a person would require significant time off work for medical reasons, which is usually seven or more days, then their employer will ask them to bring in a fit note from their doctor just to confirm why they can't work and what arrangements need to be made. Now, this is a matter of judgment for the doctor. If you as a doctor provide a fit note to an employer, there is nothing an employer can do about it legally. And it can be quite wide ranging. It might suggest that the person needs, you know, complete time off work to rest and get better. But it could also take the form of a compromise. You know, if the person wants to go back to work and the employer wants them back at work, it might suggest things like reducing their hours or maybe altering their duties at work. If they were doing heavy lifting or something, they might not want to do that while their injuries are healing, or simply a gradual phased return to work just so the person is properly rested and isn't gonna further damage themselves. So thank you so much guys for watching. This has been quite a highly requested topic, just going through each level of how our UK health system works. As I say, for those of you um, wanting to come and study here from outside the UK, I hope that was useful. If like me, you maybe didn't have the best understanding of how our system works when applying to med school from within the UK, I'd barely set foot in a hospital before going to med school. I hope that was equally useful. Thanks very much for watching guys. If you'd like to support the channel, there are three things you can do. The first thing is like, share, comment, and subscribe. You can buy me a coffee using my Ko-Fi link in the description below. Or you can save 10% off your first year's or you can save 10% off your first year subscription to Complete Anatomy 2020 from 3D4 Medical, my favorite 3D anatomy learning tool. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.